Thank you. We will move to Group 6, which is time spent on electronically monitored bail. And I call Amendment 24 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with Amendments 25 and 2. Jamie Green to move Amendment 24 and speak to all amendments in the group. Okay. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Let me just get my bearings. Um, so, uh, Group 6, uh, for the benefit of uh, members who haven't been following the bill, is uh, a section of the bill which uh, is around time spent on electronically monitored bail, uh, which for most folk uh, is commonly known as the issue of electronic tagging as a condition of bail. As drafted at the moment, uh, Section 5 uh, would require judges to consider uh, the period of time that an offender has spent on electronically monitored bail when passing a custodial sentence. The, uh, the bill before us states that if the court is passing a sentence uh, of imprisonment, then time spent on electronically monitored bail will be somehow equitable by a prescribed formula for the purposes of sentencing. In other words, this may lead to a reduction in an offender's sentence if they have spent time on electronic monitoring and that sentence is backdated accordingly to include that time spent. I know they're just coming back from their tea break, tea break so they'll be full of sugar and rowdy, presiding officer, but I do hope they'll listen to, uh, to what we have to say. It's quite an important, important part of the, uh, the bill. Um, Setting off, so I've got a couple of points to make about this, uh, which I hope uh, we can reflect on. And uh, my colleague and I have taken two, as you will spot from the amendments, quite different approaches to how we resolve this issue. Um, the first really is about the, the policy context of the government's proposal, perhaps even the legal context. And that is what uh, the point of electronically tagged bail actually is. Uh, it is commonly perceived to be a condition uh, of bail. Indeed, a judge or a sheriff may use it as a tool to avoid remanding someone uh, into custody by releasing them on bail with a condition, such as electronic monitoring. Someone who uh, has been bailed in this manner has not yet been convicted of any crime. They are, by all intents and purposes, an accused person. A sentence, however, is the custodial punishment given after someone has been convicted of a crime. The two are not the same. The second point I want to make about this proposal is more of a moral one rather than a technical one. I think this proposal, because it goes as far as to dictate the formula by which judges should use in this scenario, the government is proposing that two days spent on electronically uh, monitored tagging will somehow equate to one day spent in prison, in custody. But I would argue that time spent in your house or at work or outside with friends or in the shops with an electronic tag on is in no way the same or equal to prison time. Uh, the formula mandates how much time judges must take off an offender's sentence if they're going to prison. And it's not clear entirely to the committee where this idea A came from, B where the formula came from, and whether it was cooked up uh, in research uh, by academics or policy advisors to the government. It's entirely unclear, but it's the moral ar argument which is an important one, because for the complainant in these scenarios, or indeed the victim, uh, time spent worrying that the offender is out there with an electronic tag is in no way equal to the scenario where they know that that person is in custody behind bars. The third point I wanted to make is that I have no idea what this element has to do with this bill whatsoever. This is a bail and release bill, not a sentencing bill, and for me that is separate legislation. My comments and my views are, do not stand alone on this. Uh, there have been a number of concerns raised uh, to the committee and to members. And that was reiterated in the briefing we got just ahead of today's debate. Uh, three organisations, uh, Victim Support Scotland, Assist and Scotland's Women's Aid, were very explicit and clear about this section of the bill and this proposal. They said that we do not believe that any time spent on electronic monitoring should count as time served. I mean, it could not be more simple. The sentence received for a serious crime, including domestic abuse, sexual violence or rape, should consider the severity of the crime, victim safety and victim protection, rather than time spent subject to electronic monitoring. 
It has been suggested that time spent on bail with EM could be interpreted as being somehow more limiting to the accused, but this is an artificial and inaccurate construction. Uh, Kate Wallace from VSS went further. She said a custodial sentence is completely different from electronic monitoring at home. So we continue to disagree on that. Scottish Women's Aid uh, were equally uh, damning of this proposal. Electronic monitoring is only partial convenience, inconvenience to the movements of the accused, which it is, and is not in any way comparable to time spent on remand and should not be treated any differently from any other form of bail, which goes to my uh, first technical point. At stage two, this issue did come up. The Cabinet Secretary will know. Uh, an amendment uh, was brought forward by Colette Stevenson, perhaps after conversation with some of these victims' organisations, uh, and as is the prerogative of any backbencher to do so. I was disappointed that she chose not to push those amendments, perhaps under pressure from the government benches, when they were handed to her, perhaps in good faith, by these victims' organisations. I did, however, push those amendments to stage two, and they were rejected again on a 4-4 split, which I think is quite telling. I don't blame members for bringing these amendments forward. Uh, indeed, I'm sure they were uh, uh, heartfelt. What I've decided to do is that if the government insists on maintaining this bizarre pro proposal in this legislation, then I have two amendments to try and resolve it. Uh, amendment 24 uh, is clear that when passing the sentence, rather than the court must take into account the bail period, including that period uh, electronically monitored, it changes the word must to may. Now, again, it's a simple change, but it gives that discretion that if in the judge's uh, eyes, in that scenario, he feels it appropriate to take into account time and spent electronically monitored, then he may do so when passing sentence. But it's not a must. It's not an absolute. And the second, Amendment 25, removes the formula. Again, this bizarre formula that two days spent electronically tagged equates to one day in prison, which it doesn't. And I think everyone knows that. And there's been no evidence given to support that formula whatsoever. So my amendments take two different approaches. My colleague has a third and perhaps uh, a, a, a different way, and he will speak to that accordingly. I think, importantly, though, the committee felt overwhelmingly uh, strong about this as well. The Stage 1 report made a very specific recommendation to the government, and I'm not convinced the government have responded to that recommendation. Uh, we said that it is our view that sheriffs and judges are best placed to determine the extent to which time spent on electronic monitoring should be deducted from the length of the custodial sentences. We were clear that the formula does not work and is not appropriate. That was a cross-party consensus on the committee. There was no division on that recommendation, number 228. 229 said that we were content that if the bill does allow for time spent to be taken into account, if the court so decides, this may be a helpful change. But no such change was forthcoming. No government amendment was forthcoming, which is why I've had to bring one forward. We were very clear that it is an important principle that the courts are to be given a degree of discretion to determine such matters themselves and should not be prescribed in the face of primary legislation the way the government has done. I do look forward to hearing what the government has to say about this issue, but I really think they're going to struggle to defend this one. Presiding officer. Thank you. And I call Russell Finlay to speak to Amendment 2 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I've got one amendment, number two, in this group, and it's a small number, but a big amendment, as it completely removes section five from the bill. To reiterate what my colleague Jamie Green has just said, the bill as drafted would allow judges to deduct, deduct time off a prison sentence based on time spent on bail while wearing an electronic tag. The bill states that two days subject to electronic monitoring is equivalent to one day behind bars. This cannot be right as a point of principle. As Jamie Green has said, bail is not a punishment. The subject of bail, those subject to bail are not yet convicted. And this bill is entirely about bail and release, and it is not about sentencing. I believe these proposals could have unintended consequences that could be far-reaching. And I'd like to refer to an FOI request covering the period from May 2022 to March 2023, which I think could be useful for members. In that time, 638 accused criminals in Scotland are subject to electronically monitored bail. They spent an average of 120, 120 days on, on, under those bail conditions. So using the proposed two-for-one formula set out in the bill, 
That means they could each expect to have 60 days or two months deducted from an eventual prison sentence. And, and incredibly, and I admit these calculations are somewhat rudimentary, that equates to a combined reduction of 112 years less jail time. I believe this would risk undermining public faith in justice, and it would add to an existing perception of a gulf between sentencing spin and the reality. I believe that it would also be a gift to career criminals and their creative lawyers. Surely an offender with an electronic tag would be further incentivised to postpone their trial if every single delay that they chalk up would result in less prison time. I think this risks fueling court churn and making the court backlogs even worse than they already are. And the outcome of this would be further misery and uncertainty for victims and other witnesses. You've already heard from Jamie Green about amendments 24 and 25, which seek to improve uh, or address these, these issues. Um, I agree with his solutions, but, and we're working as a team, but I, I see his amendments as perhaps a plan B. I think the better solution, the more efficient approach, would be to scrap Section 5 in its entirety. Um, members should note that Victim Support Scotland support this amendment and they should also note, and I know Jimmy Green's touched on this as well, that an SNP member of the Criminal Justice Committee proposed a similar um, amendment at stage two. She cited, and I quote, huge concerns only to drop her own amendment, which we supported at stage two. So I think if the government is serious about this two for one deal for prisoners, they must go away and produce properly researched and a coherent argument for it, not this back of a pack approach. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, pre I do appreciate that this is one of the areas where there is a stark difference of opinion between victim support organisations and most others who have engaged with this bill over the last year or so. As Social Work Scotland stated during committee scrutiny, electronic monitoring is, and I quote, punitive, restrictive and intrusive. End quote. And it is therefore, and I pick that quote up again, right that the court considers this when imposing a prison sentence. End quote. I know that Kate Wallace and others, have, as Jamie Green has already mentioned, others who oppose taking this electronic monitored bail time into consideration when sentencing are of the view that a custodial sentence is completely different to electronic monitoring at home. I agree. However, I am also of the view that it is different to bail without any form of monitoring or surveillance. I believe that putting someone on bail and subjecting them to electronic monitoring is a not insignificant curtailment of their rights, their right to freedom of movement, their right not to be monitored by the state, to name just two. Electronic monitoring is a restriction of liberty. Our laws should recognise that and do so in a fair and consistent way. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, Section 5 of the Bill seeks to provide a new power for the court to take into account any time that an accused person spends on a relevant electronically monitored curfew condition of bail and to treat it as time served in relation to any custodial sentence it passes. It does this by granting discretion discretion to the court to decide how much of a period subject to such a curfew condition should be taken into account. The court has complete discretion on this key question. It can be none of the period, some of the period or all of the period. Once the court has decided this key question, a formula is used to convert the period in a consistent and fair manner for the purposes of calculating the time served portion of a sentence. As members have said, every two days subject to a relevant curfew from the qualifying bail period becomes one day of time served should uh, the court wish to implement that. Question from Mr Green about where this comes from. This is based on a very similar formula operating in England and Wales. As I have explained, discretion is provided to the court to assess the circumstances of a specific case before it decides whether an accused person should have some, all or none of their bail period accounted for. 
This allows consideration of the conduct of an accused person while subject to the relevant curfew condition. Clearly, a person who did not comply with a relevant curfew is not likely to have any period accounted for in their custodial sentence. And this is very much best left to the court to decide in any given case. The bill ensures the court has the necessary and important discretion. The combined effect of Amendment 24 and 25 would be to still provide the court with a statutory discretion to account for time spent on a relevant curfew condition, but to do so in such a way that there would be no legal requirement for consistency across the country. This is because there would be no formula set out in statute for the court to use in converting a time period subject to a relevant curfew condition for the purposes of time served of a custodial sentence. It would lead to the potential for inconsistency in how the relevant time period is converted for time served purposes, and it is not how the law in England and Wales approaches this area, which the proposals in the bill have been informed by. I would therefore ask Mr Green not to press Amendment 24 and 25, and if he does, that members vote against them. Presiding Officer, Amendment 2 in the name of Russell Finlay seeks to remove Section 5 from the bill in its entirety. The principle of enabling time spent on electronically monitored curfew bill to be accounted for at sentencing it was, of course, consulted on by the Scottish Government in 2021. It was in the bill at introduction and, of course, uh, the Criminal Justice Committee have given it a uh, due scrutiny and consideration. It is worth noting that it was supported in the Criminal Justice Committee Stage 1 report, uh, which said that allowing time spent on electronic monitoring to be taken into account at sentencing if the court decides is a helpful change, although I do acknowledge that there are different views amongst committee members, as we've heard today. Presiding officer, while a person who is subject to electronically monitored bail with a curfew condition is not the same position as someone in custody, such a measure does represent a restriction on their liberty. The bill therefore enables the court to take cognizance of this if it chooses to do so in a proportionate way when a custodial sentence is imposed. As I've mentioned, this is a measure which brings Scotland into line with similar arrangements in England and Wales, uh, and the Committee Report on Balance reported favourably upon it. And I therefore ask Mr Finlay not to press Amendment 2, but if he does, I would ask the Chamber to vote against it. Thank you. Jamie Green to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 24. Uh, thank you. And can I thank members for participating uh, in this uh, short group and thank the Cabinet Secretary for her comments. I think just wanted to uh, sum up with a, a number of points uh, and it really reflects perhaps on the, the point that Maggie Chapman made about this correlation between being uh, electron electronically moder monitored whilst on bail versus being in, in custody. I mean the whole premise of the bill which we discussed at great length earlier was that the government is trying to reduce the amount of people that are being remanded and, and one of the tools in which that uh, has proven over the past couple of years is the use of electronic monitoring as a condition of bail and, and in some ways it's an incentive uh, to to keep people uh, out of custody uh, when they can be monitored in other ways uh, there are many other conditions of bail as, as we know um, it is not the same though as somebody who has been convicted of a crime and if someone has been given a custodial sentence well two things one is it's quite likely to be a serious crime given the presumption against short sentences, which uh, would rule out any form of custodial sentence. Uh, and secondly, uh, there is the, the aspect, which I think many of the victim support organizations rightly raise, is the fairness aspect. And that's that somebody uh, who is, for example, and I, I do propose the scenario where um, someone is on bail. As we know, there are, there are lengthy delays to trials. Um, there is also the added element which Russell Finlay, I think, rightly pointed out, which is the issue of court churn and, in many cases, delaying tactics used uh, by an accused. It is feasible that somebody could spend a, a tremendous amount of time on bail under electronic monitoring, only to then be given a custodial sentence when that trial diet finally comes to court. The sentence is A, backdated, and B, now, according to this formula, is converted into... Uh, a, re a reduction as well. So the two together could mean potentially, in a second, yeah, but the potential there is that somebody who could be given a custodial sentence, given the seriousness of the types of offences that are, that generally result in a custodial sentence, could effectively walk out of the court that day as a result of A, 
the delay in the trial and B, the electronic monitoring formula. I think Victim Sports got on a right to say that the two are not the same and that there is a sense of unfairness and injustice in that. And it's that reason that I brought the amendments forward today. I'm happy to give way. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, as I already said in my remarks, um, time on curfew electronic monitoring um, in the community uh, is not the same as a custodial sentence. But I wonder if Mr Green would accept that in terms of the bill, there is no compulsion on the court to take time on electronic monitoring into consideration that the court has complete discretion in this matter and may choose to not, uh, not, not to implement this. Jamie Green. Well, in that case, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary would be happy to accept my amendment, which makes that abundantly clear. In Section 5, where we say time spent on electronically monitored bail, after Section 210 of the 1995 Act, consideration of time spent on electronically monitored bail, uh, the, when passing sentence, the court must have regard to the bail period, and so on and so forth. It's all on page four of the bill. By changing the word must to may, it makes it abundantly clear that it could be a matter of discretion for judges, which, if that's the policy intention, is fine. But at the moment, the must is what concerns me, which is why I brought the amendment forward. It's not entirely clear that the judges do have full discretion. If they had full discretion, then surely they would be the ones that would decide how much time should be deducted from the sentence, not a prescribed formula in the face of primary legislation coming from politicians. So I'm not convinced they have full discretion in the matter. And in that sense, that's why my second amendment seeks to remove the formula stated because no evidence has been given to back it up. There's no equation that says that two days spent electronically monitored is in any way the same as a day spent in custody and anyone who's ever been in side of prison to visit or to speak to people will know that it's an entirely different environment and that those who are on bail being electronically monitored I understand there is a condition of bail but that the two are in no way the same and they're not, certainly not a punishment and I think any victim of crime who have experienced uh, a serious offence will be I think quite astonished to think that somehow that somebody's sentence will be reduced as a result of wearing a tag it has lost its sense of fairness and it's that which I'm trying to reintroduce into the legislation. For that reason, I move my amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 24 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 28. No, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 25 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 24. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. Point of order, Pam Duncan Glancy. My app wouldn't refresh, I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. I call Jeremy Balfour for a point of order. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I couldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Balfour. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 25 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 28, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 24. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number two in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 28, no 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move on to group seven, reports on bail and remand. I call amendment 26 in the name of Jamie Green. Grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, Jamie Green to move amendment 26 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll only speak to the, my own amendments in this group in the interest of time. Uh, amendment 26 uh, relates to uh, well, this entire group. It relates to a new section of the bill that was added at stage two, section 5A, by the Cabinet Secretary, and I think in response to many requests from members right across the board on additional reporting requirements on, the, uh, on, on how this bill would affect uh, the justice system. Um, essentially, section 5A requires uh, Scottish ministers to produce a quite wide-ranging report on bail and remand and a number of statistics, such as the remand population of prisons and the number of offences that people are convicted for, and, the, and all that is set out in, in the bail at stage two. Amendment 26 is a fairly simple one. It would require that Scottish ministers, first of all, consult with victims and or support organisations uh, when producing this report. And I think consultation uh, is helpful in addition to statistical analysis, because it, as part of that report, we will be recording the number of convictions for bail-related offences to be reported, including offences committed by individuals on bail. And I think because of that, behind these statistics of bail-related offences, generally are victims, often the victims of the primary crime itself, of which the bail condition is attached to, and subsequent breach thereof. So I, it's unclear to me how a report on the use of bail and remand, as dictated by the rest of the bill, um, could be properly informed without consulting uh, 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 with uh, those uh, victims of crime to whom the statistics re uh, relate, which is why 
um, I would ask members to support Amendment 26. Amendment 26 is also supported by victims' organisations. Amendment 34 is technical consequential because it describes what is a victim support service. I know in, her, in another group, uh, um, Cabinet Secretary commented that that, uh, that was used. Uh, the words victim support services were used in another amendment, but were not defined, but they are defined in Amendment 34, perhaps not in the same section, but I, I, I did catch up eventually on that, uh, and it tries to go some way using uh, appropriate language uh, as recommended by drafters. Amendment 79, I think asks for a, m a more overarching and a fundamental ask that I have of the government, and that's the impact that the bill uh, will have. And so essentially, rather than just the statistical numbers, which reports often have, reports can also be uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative in its nature. Uh, I think it's important that whatever your views on the elements of the bill or the bill per se, um, the government analyses how it has affected the Roman population, because ultimately that seems to be the main driver of the legislation. It's certainly part one. Also, importantly, it would require ministers to assess how many, uh, how many changes uh, to the Roman population has it impacted victims, which is the second ask, and indeed the experience of victims, which is something that we talk about uh, often. And I think given some of the uncertainties of the outcomes that some of the other uh, measures of the bill will have, I think it's entirely right to ask that the report that the government does it uh, looks at the, uh, what effect the remand population and changes to increases, decreases, uh, will have. In fact, I'd go as far as saying if you only learn two things in this report, is one, what is the effect that the bill has had on the remand population? And secondly, what effect has it had on the experiences of victims in our justice system? And then that in itself would be a good report and good information. That's why I've included this amendment. I hope uh, the Cabinet Secretary will look upon it sympathetically and not see it as overly onerous. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't go into any great detail to dictate how, how detailed or lengthy that report must be, but I think it would be useful information. Uh, reports 20, uh, amendments 28 and 29 are two very specific metrics on the data side that I would like to see included in this report. Uh, first of all, Amendment 28 specifies the use of particular types of bill that should be recorded in this report that the ministers will publish, and it specifically references the type uh, of electronically monitored bill uh, which, as we just discussed, could be used to deduct, deduct time from, from a, a, f a future sentence. I think that would be helpful information. And 29 uh, goes a little bit further on that uh, and asks that uh, ministers record uh, the number of people who enter the prison population following a conviction for a bail-related offence, first of all, and specifically, and secondly, having been accused of a further offence. And the reason for that is quite a simple one. Um, I think it's really important that if the bail numbers do increase, uh, I would like to know uh, how many of those people end up back in the system as a direct result of a bill-related offence. I think that's helpful data for us to see uh, whether the bill has produced uh, good outcomes or otherwise. Equally, people who have been billed, perhaps as a result of changes to the test or others, um, who then go on to commit other types of offences, I think any collection of data that, that shows the nature of those offences as they come back into the system. We do know there is a reoffending rate how many of those uh, are on bail or are, 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 are on uh, release from, from previous convictions. But more data is better than, than less, in my view, on this. And I, I hope that members will look uh, sympathetically on my asks and that the government will not see them as difficulties. And indeed, if the government seeks to uh, reject these, as they may do, uh, I suspect in, in the Cabinet Secretary's comments, I would ask for at least uh, a willingness to, uh, when uh, they produce... Uh, the guidance around the report or even the, the structure of the report for civil servants and um, that they may consider what further information that may not necessarily be on the face of the bill here in black and white but any other data that they think could be collectible that would be useful as we analyse or a future parliament analyses the efficacy of this bill. Thank you. Thank you Mr Green. I call Katie Clark to speak to Amendment 76 and other amendments in the group. Ms Clark. Thank you presiding officer. Amendments 76 77 and 80 require the Scottish Government to give more information about women on remand. We know that Scotland has high numbers of women on remand and that this is not because women in Scotland are more violent than in other countries which do not have many or as many women in custody. There has been concern over many years about the number 
of women in Scotland being sent to prison for non-violent offences. We also know that women prisoners are a significantly different demographic than male prisoners. A recent study showed that almost 80% had suffered head injuries as a result of domestic abuse. We also know that many have caring responsibilities. Legislators need as much information as possible about women who are being refused bail to better scrutinise the justice system. Amendments 76, 77 and 80 are modified versions of amendments I put down at stage two and I thank the Scottish Government for working with me on the wording of these amendments to ensure the data asked for is data that is available. Amendments 78 and 81 are also similar to amendments I put down at stage two and ask the Scottish Government to report to this Parliament within three years on the health issues, including drug addiction, uh, addiction issues of women being held on remand. Again, this is a less onerous requirement than those sought in the amendments I put down at stage two, and I hope the Scottish Government will be able to agree to my amendment on this occasion. Amendment 82 is also a reporting requirement. It focuses on the alternatives of custody available to the courts in Scotland when considering bail application. For Scotland to reduce the number of prisoners we hold on remand, we need to develop more robust alternatives to custody, including a range of supervised bail options. Um, I should say that this, member, this amendment is supported by COSLA, and the amendment asks the Scottish Government to consult with local authorities and others and to report to this Parliament with three years of the work being done to develop further alternatives for remand so that accused persons, wherever possible, can be kept in the community pending trial. This would include information on the resources which are being devoted to ensuring there are adequate resourcing of services needed to ensure that bail conditions are complied with. We know at the moment there is considerable criticism of the implementation, for example, of the tracking of electronic monitoring by victims' organisations. The report would focus on the resourcing of non-custodial alternatives to remand. In many other countries, such as the Scandinavian countries, there is far greater use of, of alternatives to custody, such as GPRS, electronic monitoring and supervised bail. And we believe that there is considerable scope for this to be expanded in Scotland. I move the amendments in my name. Thank you, Ms Clark. I now call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 62 and other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I will speak to all amendments in this group, starting with the amendment in my name, Amendment 62. This is a technical amendment which amends the commencement provision of Section 14 of the Bill to account for the addition of the reporting requirement provision at Section 5A of the Bill. Amendments 26 and 34 by Jamie Green are intended to place a duty on the Scottish Ministers to consult with providers of victim support services when preparing the report on bail and remand under Section 5A of the Bill. I support the intention behind these amendments, um, however, I, I consider them not um, necessary as I consider humbly uh, my amendment uh, 31 uh, to make uh, similar provision as it did in Group 3. As already explained, it provides that where the report includes information on the operation of the legislative changes made by Part 1 of the Bill, the Scottish Ministers must consult with providers of victim services, as well as others, including Police Scotland, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and local authorities when preparing the report. I would ask the Chamber to vote against Amendments 26 and 34 and support uh, my Amendment 31 instead. Presiding officer, I speak in support of Amendments 76, 77 and 80 lodged by Katie Clark. I would, however, not be able to support Amendments 78 and 81 for the reasons that I will explain. At stage two, I lodged an amendment that was welcomed by the committee, which added a new general reporting requirement falling on Scottish ministers in relation to bail and remand. Alongside my amendment at stage two was an amendment from Ms Clark, which sought to add in specific elements relating to reporting on women on remand. 
We were not able to support that amendment as it contains certain requirements that would not be able to be included as data simply does not exist and it could not be readily connected. For example, detailed data on health conditions of women on remand, such as their mental health, is not data that is collected presently, nor could it easily be collected. There would also potentially be privacy concerns given the small overall numbers of women held on remand, as well as other possible chance, uh, challenges, given that some of this information would certainly be NHS information and would certainly require a new data collection. However, I would hope uh, that some reassurance would be given to members, uh, given the general power uh, to add matters uh, for consideration in, in the future um, as, as required and as new information becomes available. Amendments 78 and 81 bring back these requirements with Amendment 78, adding them into the general reporting requirement in Section 5A of the Bill and Amendment 81 separately seeking to add them in a new section. Both amendments 78 and 81 seem essentially to do the same thing. And while I am sympathetic to the intent, I just cannot agree to a legal duty to report on issues where I cannot be satisfied it will be possible for Scottish ministers to deliver on that requirement. It is for these reasons that I cannot support amendments 78 and 81. Presiding officer, we did, however, accept the overall thrust of what Katie Clark was seeking to achieve at stage two, which was to ensure good, achievable data is included, which helps improve our understanding of why women are remanded, including details of their background and what happens after remand has ended. And we're very pleased to support amendments 76, 77 and 18 Katie Clark's name, which ensure the report to be produced by the Scottish ministers does explicitly include certain information relating to women on remand, for example, the age profile uh, of, of, of the women. In addition, the general power, as I've already mentioned, for ministers to add in additional matters to the report that are not listed is strengthened by emphasising that gender-specific information can be added. I ask members to support amendments 76, 77 and 80 while asking members to oppose 78 and 81. Amendments 28 and 29 by Jamie Green amend the reporting requirement by adding to the list of matters that the report must include. While amendments 28 and 29 are again well intentioned, I am unable to support them as currently drafted as they have technical deficiencies, which would mean the Scottish ministers may not be able to fulfil the reporting requirement. However, that does not mean that the data in these areas cannot be published as the reporting requirement in the bill only specifies the minimum information that the report must include, uh, with the Scottish ministers retaining that general power to include any other information that the Scottish ministers consider appropriately. Specifically on Amendment 28, I agree with Jamie Green that it would be useful to publish data on the use of electronic monitoring of bail conditions. While the Scottish Government does not hold this information, we can work with the provider of electronic monitoring, G4S, in order to report in this area in line with the reporting duty already contained within the Bill. Due to the manner in which data is collected, I understand the report would require to be on the number of bail orders that contained a condition of electronic monitoring rather than the number of individuals subject to a condition of electronic monitoring. This is something I commit to look into and it can be delivered without legislative provision being added to the reporting requirement. The second aspect of Amendment 20 relates to the number of individuals released on bail with special conditions. Again, this is not data that is currently held by the Scottish Government and no corresponding amendment has been brought forward to provide for the recording and collection of that data. However, we will undertake to work with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to better understand what data the courts hold in this area and how it could be reported upon for future publication. It is important to strike a balance between publishing more meaningful data on bail and remand while not unduly placing onerous burdens on the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and other justice agencies. For Amendment 29, as there is no definitional provision within the amendment, it is assumed the reference to prison population is referring to the number of individuals who enter custody having been sentenced to imprisonment or detention for a bail-related offence. 
I can advise that the published criminal proceedings data already provides a breakdown of sentencing outcomes uh, for bail-related offences, including custodial sentences. The data is not a count of individuals, as the same person may be convicted of multiple offences, and each is counted separately in the data. The meaning of the second aspect of Amendment 29 is not clear, though it appears to be seeking data on the number of individuals remanded into custody, having been accused of committing a further offence whilst on bail. So essentially the number of people accused of offences with a bail aggravation attached. Again, as this data is principally held by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, we will explore with them uh, whether data uh, that the Scottish Government ha has access to could be used to provide information in this area and, if so, make use of the general power of the Scottish Ministers to add any additional information beyond which is specifically set out in Section 5A. At this stage, without a guarantee of being able to provide the information, we cannot support Amendment 29, but I hope I've showed um, willingness in this area going forward. The Scottish Government will, of course, explore with justice agencies what data can be published in these areas as part of the general powers in the reporting requirement of Part 1 of the Bill. Within that context, and for the specific reasons I have outlined, I ask Jamie Green not to press Amendments 20 and 29, and if he does, I ask members to vote against them. Jamie Green's Amendment 79 seeks to amend the reporting requirement of Section 5A of the Bill to introduce two new requirements for that report to include. These requirements would be an analysis of the effects that the reforms this Bill makes to the legal framework on bail and remand have on the remand population and whether any changes to the remand population that result from that have had an impact on the experiences of victims. I can very much sympathise with the intention behind the amendment. In an ideal world, uh, this Parliament would want to know exactly how legislation it passes will directly impact uh, on education outcomes, health outcomes and, indeed, in this case, justice outcomes. However, the fact is that the operation of the justice system is a complex mix of ever-changing variables and it's not always possible to separate out those variables from the effect of specific legislation such as this bill. There are many factors which can affect the size of the remand population, for example, the nature of offences committed, the number of offences committed, changes to the detection rates by the police, all of which can have an impact. Because of this, it simply isn't possible to isolate the impact of this legislation specifically as distinct from other factors influencing the remand population to enable the Scottish Ministers to report on it. By extension, it is also not going to be possible to identify the extent to which victims' experiences may be impacted as a result of the changes to the law in bail and remand as distinct from other factors that may affect decisions on bail and remand in individual cases, but I accept the point that there is uh, a need to always uh, gather qualitative uh, information as well as quantitative. And I therefore ask Mr Green not to press Amendment 79, but if he does, I would ask the Chamber to vote against it. Katie Clark's Amendment 82 seeks to put in place a requirement for the Scottish Ministers to report to Parliament on the resourcing of the implementation of bail conditions. I'm not persuaded on this amendment or that it would be possible to assess specifically what resourcing is required to implement bail conditions. As it is unclear what is meant by implementation of conditions, the impact on resources will be difficult to measure. I assume this perhaps means enforcement of bail conditions. Also, the amendment refers to bail conditions generally rather than any specific type of condition. In every case where bail is granted, conditions are imposed as standard, so preparing a report of this nature would be a significant undertaking. I note that Amendment 82 is focused in particular on the impact of implementing bail conditions on local authorities. Local authorities are, of course, involved in such schemes as bail supervision, However, enforcement of bail conditions is primarily a matter for Police Scotland. In that context, it's not clear how the Scottish Ministers would assess whether the enforcement of bail conditions is adequately resourced, given it forms part of the general responsibilities for Police Scotland in day-to-day -day general policing activity. As such, it is just not a requirement that Scottish Ministers would realistically be able to meet. And within that context, uh, I would ask members uh, not to support Amendment 82. And I thank uh, Chamber for their forbearance on a lengthy speaking note. 
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call Jamie Green to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 26. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her extremely comprehensive response, uh, which is uh, duly noted and all a matter of public record. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute to Audrey Nicholl, who was the only person who had her eyes up throughout most of that. It was a bit like being at the bingo hall. Everyone had their eyes down this afternoon. I appreciate it's not the most exciting group reporting requirements, but they always appear in every bill. We all know that. Um, I did feel it was an opportunity for members right across the board uh, to, um, to ask for more from the government. And I've heard there have been a number of uh, commitments made, again, all a matter of public record. Well, I'm sure uh, future uh, uh, MSPs and respective portfolio holders will hold the government to account on those. I think there is a wider issue, which is that around data in general. And, and one of the things we really struggled with as a committee uh, was using data to inform uh, decision-making and scrutiny. The Cabinet Secretary just said earlier that she's a big fan of evidence-led policy. Well, uh, this is an opportunity to ensure that whatever the outcomes of this bill are, that we use evidence, uh, and particularly at Amendment 79, where we do want to know what the, what the impact this specific bill has, A, on the demand population, B, on, on the, uh, the experience of victims in the justice system, because I think that's what really lies at the heart of it. If it can be achieved in any other way, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, by me. Uh, the Chamber will be pleased to know that I won't be moving any of the amendments in Group 7. Right. Could, I, can, could I please confirm with Mr Green that he is seeking to withdraw Amendment 26? Uh, correct. Okay. Um, I uh, note that Jimmy Green seeks to withdraw Amendment 26. Does any member object? No member objects. Amendment 26 is therefore withdrawn. I call Amendment 76 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 26. Katie Clark, Clark to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 77 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 26. Katie Clark to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed to. Yes. No, the question isn't. The, I call Amendment 78 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 26. Katie Clark to move or not move? Move. Yes. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Alistair Allen. I said no, the system failed. Okay, uh, that vote will be recorded. Point of order, Angus Robertson. No, presiding officer. Um, and the system failed. Yeah, the system wasn't working. Yes. Thank you. That vote will be recorded. Point of order, Siobhan Brown. Could we have Siobhan Brown's microphone, please? Thank you. So, sorry, the system wasn't working. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Your vote will be recorded. Point 
Point of order, Cabinet Secretary. Biden officer, the system would not allow me to vote. If it did, I would have voted no. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Your vote will be recorded. Point of order, Sharon Dowie. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Dowie. Your vote will be recorded. Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, apologies, presiding officer. Uh, the system wouldn't load. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Balfour. Your vote will be recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 78 in the name of Katie Clark is yes 48, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 27 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary to move or not move? Move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 26. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. The question is that Amendment... Oh, I call Amendment 29 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 26. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 79 in the name of Jamie, Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 26. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Also not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 30 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 80 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 26. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 31. In the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Moved, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 32 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 33 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Move, President Officer. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 26. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 35 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 36 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 81 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 26. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 82 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 26. Katie Clark, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. That moves us on to Group 8 on release on certain days of the week. I call Amendment 10 in the name of Russell Finlay, grouped with Amendments 11 and 12. And I call Russell Finlay to move Amendment 10 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Finlay. Thank you. I move Amendment 10 which is one of three amendments in this group. 11 and 12 are substantial, while 10 is a consequential to 11. Now, the bill as drafted seeks to extend the days on which prisoners cannot be released. This uh, provision is already the case that prisoners cannot be released on Saturdays, Sundays and on public holidays. And the bill as drafted would also prevent release on Fridays. The reasoning is that prisoners released in these days often don't have the support they need, whether relating to housing, benefits or health care. This can 
and indeed has resulted in serious issues including reoffending and overdoses. Now, various criminal justice organisations, not least the Scottish Police Federation, have concerns about this proposal. But what members may not realise is that the bill also seeks to effectively end Thursday releases. And I say effectively because there is an exception to this. Thursday releases will only be allowed if the scheduled release date happens to fall on one of the non-release days already identified. But the bill will effectively concentrate almost all releases into just three days of the week, Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Now, this is presumably well-intentioned, but it risks putting greater pressure on the prison service and others, including criminal justice social workers. And it's worth quoting from the Stage 1 report, which was agreed to by all members of the Criminal Justice Committee, that this, and I quote, uh, may result in significant practical challenges and additional resources required. Um, this is where amendment number 12 comes in. This would empower prison governors. It would allow them to release a prisoner on any day of the week that they see fit, where they consider it to be appropriate. My party believes that governors uh, should be trusted and they should be trusted to use their knowledge and experience to exercise judgment and discretion. A blanket ban on release days is clumsy and ill-judged, given the risks of the unintended consequences, some of which I've already touched on. I now turn to amendment number 11. If members choose to reject amendment 12, then amendment 11 gives prison governors the option of ordering a Thursday release. So agreeing to 11 would at least go some way to mitigating the potential damage by increasing the proposed three standard release days to four. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finlay. I now call the Cabinet Secretary. Poseidon Officer, Section 6 of the Bill seeks to end scheduled liberations on a Friday and the day before a public holiday, adding those days to the existing list of days when release from prison cannot take place. That currently includes weekends and public holidays. This is to enable more people to access the community-based services they need immediately on release, services like housing, mental health and addiction support, and contact with justice social work. Those are services that will keep them and others safe. In adding Fridays and the day before public holidays to the existing list of accepted days, it is clear that more releases uh, will take place on a Thursday. That would place increased pressure on both community-based services and the prison service on that one day of the week and would risk undermining the intent of the provision. That is why Section 6 of the Bill also provides that individuals whose release date ordinarily falls on a Thursday will have their release date uh, moved to the nearest preceding suitable date. In most instances... Yes. Russell Finlay. Th thank you. I, I just wonder if um, the Cabinet Secretary accepts that by reducing the number of days yet further is only going to increase the pressure. Cabinet Secretary. Actually, the point that I would wish to explain to Mr Finlay is that uh, releases uh, would take place not on three days of the week, but on four days of the week. This, um, the, the bill recognises that if you're uh, displacing people who would have been released on a Friday to a Thursday, that you need to spread the load from those who would have been released on a Thursday um, to a Friday. And the statistics that I have um, received from the Scottish Prison Service show uh, that releases um, on Mondays and Tuesdays tend to have a much lower, lower um, to be of a, a lower number uh, than uh, Thursdays and Fridays. So this is actually about spreading the load um, over four days of the week to ensure people can access the services uh, that will keep them and others safe. Um, presiding officer, in, in, in terms of um, so in most instances, for those who would be due to be released on a Thursday, as I said, they would be released um, on, on the Wednesday the day before. Um, Mr Finlay's amendments 11 and 12 seek to alter that provision by including the ability of, the, of a prison governor to override that restriction. 
In the case of the list of accepted days, the Governor, um, if Mr Finlay's um, amendment is accepted, could override the restriction if they considered that release of the prisoner is necessary in the interests of public safety. And I assume the intention is to address situations where there might be a public safety concern around bringing the release forward in order to avoid accepted date, but it's not clear in the drafting or the legal effect of the amendment. In the case of a scheduled release on a Thursday, the power would apply where the Governor considers it appropriate. Now, even putting aside the technical difficulties with the amendment, in order to make that assessment, Governors would have to have access, they would have to assess every release scheduled to take place on an accepted day or on a Thursday. And that is a significant ask. It also cuts across the intent of the provision, which, as I've explained, is to support access to the services that people need to keep them safe, of course. Jim Green. Uh, this is a point which the committee spent a lot of time looking at. I think it's important for the benefit of others in the Chamber to recognise that the reason that we're having to curtail the days in which people can be released is the lack of provision of public services, even on working days and especially on a Friday. So it's a failure of other public services that we're having to take this resort. It's, it's not necessarily a, a benefit to those being released. It's an, it's a, it is, in fact, uh, detrimental in some ways. and it, it, We should have access to proper public services for those being released, with, particularly those with specific addiction problems, mental health issues and other healthcare problems, to try and reduce reoffending in, in, in that vicious circle. Would the Cabinet Secretary accept that we wouldn't have to be doing this if other public services were meeting the demand that is asked of them? Cabinet Secretary. Sign off, sir, I would in part accept that uh, without more flexibility of provision uh, in public services, um, that that has indeed um, informed considerations, but it isn't, it isn't the, 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 the sole uh, consideration here. And I would also like to remind the Chamber that this was a key recommendation from the Drug Deaths Task Force. Um, also south of the border, they have um, moved in this direction too. Uh, to end uh, Friday liberations and as I said earlier to, to Chamber if you're ending Friday liberations you do of course need to give a prudent and practical consideration uh, to um, the, the rest of, of the week and there is strong um, stakeholder uh, support for this provision but as I said I would accept um, that uh, matters uh, could be improved if there was more flexibility um, in terms of opening hours out of our services. But we also have to acknowledge, with the best will in the world, that not all services that someone requires on release will indeed be open 24-7. So I think for a broad range of reasons, this is a, a, a prudent uh, way, way forward. Poseidon officer, it is um, difficult to see how releasing someone on a day when access to services are, are, are limited for, for a variety of reasons, whether that's a Saturday or a, or a Sunday, and it's difficult to see how that would be in the interests um, of public safety. Um, and that's you know, one of the reasons why I'm questioning uh, Mr Finlay's proposition for the, the, the Governor um, to be able to exercise discretion in this area. Furthermore, adding more complexity and uncertainty to the release process could make it more difficult to make effective plans uh, for a prisoner's release. So, therefore, I cannot support amendments 11 or 12 uh, or the associated technical amendment 10, and I would ask Mr Finlay not to press them. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Russell Finlay to wind up and to press or withdraw amendment 10. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I do struggle to follow the, the logic. It seems that by ending Friday releases for the reasons given, then effectively Thursday releases are off the table too. And the Cabinet Secretary referred to SPS statistics, which she's privy to, about release dates and the numbers of prisoners. And I can only say I wish, as a committee, we had access to this data during our considerations, because this is a recurring theme, like with some of the other earlier amendments where you know if information has been forthcoming if the government and its agencies are frank and willing to share information and data then we are in a much better place to produce amendments that are competent and able to withstand 
some government scrutiny. I will. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer, and uh, my, my thanks to Mr Finlay for, for giving me. Let me just put uh, on the record now uh, some of the information that I was referring to. So, uh, in, in any year, uh, we will see um, almost 15,000 liberations per annum. In the year 22-23, uh, there were over 4,000 liberations on a Friday. Um, but uh, there were 2,613 liberations uh, on a Thursday. Um, and if I can be clear with Mr Finlay um, again, that those whose liberation falls on a Thursday, that in most cases they would be released uh, on a Wednesday. And once again assure him that the Scottish Prison Service is utilising its, its opportunity to release prisoners on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and a Thursday and not three days a week. Russell Finley. Yeah, it's, it's great that you've, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has that data and it again goes back to the point I was trying to make which is we didn't have this data um, and I think just going back to the point about the days of the week if you follow this to its logical conclusion you'll end up with one day of the week Mondays will be the only release day and everyone will get in, end up getting released on the same day it, 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 the thing it does not make sense and, and in fact the Cabinet Secretary still has not addressed the point that was made by her colleagues and colleagues from across the chamber on the Criminal Justice Committee in the Stage 1 report. As Jamie Green has said, this, uh, the, the, the provision in this bill to reduce the, the days of the week is arrived at through failure of the government to properly fund the services that need to support prisoners. The Cabinet Secretary also talked about services not being available 24-7, but I really don't think it's too much to ask for the services to work 9 to 5 um, so for all those reasons, I think we uh, intend to push these and I would ask members to give proper consideration to supporting these amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 27, no 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 11 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with amendment 10. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Uh, moved. The question is that amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. Point of order, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The system wouldn't work. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Gibson. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 11 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 27, no 84. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 12 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with amendment 10. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. We now turn to group 9, release of short-term prisoners, and I call amendment 83 in the name of Russell Finlay in a group on its own. I call Russell Finlay to uh, move and speak to Amendment 83. Thank you. Um, I have a single amendment in this group, which is number 83, in which I move. Now, as before, this is about building public trust and confidence by striving to improve sentencing and tr transparency. In 2015, Nicola Sturgeon stated, and I quote, our objective remains to end the policy of automatic early release completely as soon as we are able to. So eight years later, automatic early release remains in place for criminals sentenced to four years or less. Every single prisoner is set free early, regardless of how badly they have behaved in prison or what risk they might pose to the public. Amendment 83 can finally put this right. It would mean that the release of an offender sentenced to four years or less must be approved by either the parole board or the relevant prison governor. There are frequent examples of those automatically released early going on to commit heinous crimes. Martin Stewart is a serial criminal who was jailed for two years for robbing an elderly woman. He was released after serving just eight months, yet two days later he was back on the streets and back targeting the elderly, in this case disguise, disguising himself as a postman to do so. He then killed a 79-year-old woman in her own home in Edinburgh. Now, if a prison governor or the parole board were able to conduct an assessment on whether prisoners are fit to be released, perhaps we might prevent some of these crimes. These professionals are surely best placed to make these critical assessments. The principle behind this amendment is that prisoners should have to demonstrate improved behaviour and that they are safe to be released. Now, at stage two, my version of this amendment only gave the parole board the power to do this. However, due to the risk of overloading the board, I have widened my amendment so that prison governors have that power too. This, I think, would help to share the burden. Now, crucially, this amendment allows sentences imposed by sheriffs and judges to be served in full unless an offender can prove they have improved their behaviour and are fit for release. This, I believe, is common sense, and I hope all members agree with me and indeed with Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Automatic early release has been part of our justice system for 30 years. Ending it would be a significant change to that system. But ending it in this way would be quite concerning in terms of process. It was not subject to specific consultation, nor was it a focus of the Bill's consultation or scrutiny. And it was not discussed at all in committee, apart from when a similar amendment was submitted by Russell Findlay at stage two. I do not consider this to be an appropriate way to legislate and would urge colleagues to vote against this amendment if pressed. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I appreciate people have very strong views about automatic early release. Uh, amendment 83 uh, would end automatic early release for short-term prisoners. It would require release of all short-term prisoners to be recommended by the parole board or by the prison governor. However, Mr Finlay's amendment does not specify which cases the parole board would be the decision-makers 
and in which cases would fall to the prison governor. The amendment is uh, largely the same as the amendment Mr Finlay lodged at stage two. The issue was, of course, briefly um, debated at committee then, um, although not in nearly as much detail as a change of this magnitude would require. And I think that was a, a matter recognised by uh, most members of the committee. And members of the committee uh, did express their concerns about a change of this nature being introduced at stage two of this bill. Uh, and as a result, at that point, Mr Finlay did not press it to the vote. Presiding officer, ending automatic early release for short-term prisoners uh, would be a significant change to the justice system uh, with associated uh, substantial costs. It is important uh, that I make Chamber aware of that. The level of change required uh, requires careful and detailed consultation and consideration. Uh, I would contend that it should not be made on the basis of a short debate in a committee at stage two, uh, nor today at stage three of a bill when it's not been subject to any scrutiny or consultation. I would also again highlight that Scotland is not alone in having a system of automatic early release. It also operates in England and Wales and other jurisdictions in one form or another. As I said in stage two, I am not dismissing the points raised by Mr Findlay. This amendment raises wider and important questions of who and what prison is for and about sentencing more generally. However, as I said during that debate, if a change were to be made, then these points should be discussed in more detail and with more context. Ending automatic early release would have significant consequences for the operation of the justice and prison system. And I don't think we should be deciding on such a fundamental shift in justice policy and practice without proper and full consideration of the consequences. That would include consultation uh, with expert stakeholders too, as well as victims. And I am interested in why Mr Findlay thinks it's appropriate to make such a radical change without that detailed consultation. And this amendment could lead to higher prison population by substantially increasing the proportion of their sentence that short-term prisoners serve. As an illustration, if short-term prisoners served an average of five-sixths of their sentence, rather than one half, then the population could be expected to rise by almost 1,400. And this, of course, has uh, financial implications. The estimated cost of a prison place is at 42,000 per annum. So this unfunded amendment could lead to additional costs of around £59 million, along with potentially significant capital costs associated with expanding uh, the prison estate to address the increase in population. This amendment also creates uh, risks, as with Mr Finlay's amendment at stage two. While amendment 83 would result in short-term prisoners being released on licence, it makes no provision for how that is to work in practice. It makes no provision for what would happen were a released short-term prisoner to breach a condition of their licence. So what would happen in that instance, this needs to be thought through if it's a serious proposition by the member. Under Mr Finlay's amendment, there is no mechanism for Scottish ministers to take any action to address this, as there is for all other prisoners released on licence whose licences can be revoked and who can be recalled to prison. Such action requires a clear legislative basis which is not provided here. And it is for those reasons that I ask Mr Finlay not to move Amendment 83. Thank you. Uh, and I call Russell Finlay to wind up press a withdrawal Amendment 83, Mr Finlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I start with uh, reference to Maggie Chapman's contribution. Um, this, as we've already said, is a bill about bail and release. It's not about sentencing yet. There's a whole section that relates to sentencing around electronic monitoring. And I think, therefore, if the government is able to sort of piggyback this legislation to talk about sentencing, it's perfectly reasonable for opposition members to do the same. The Cabinet Secretary describes my proposition as radical. I don't think she means that in a good way. Um, I would like to think it's actually bold and ambitions, ambitious. And there's actually no reason, as far as I can see, why it cannot be enacted. 
I think the real reason perhaps is that it's all part of the drive to reduce the prison population, which Jamie Green stated at the outset has not really been properly explained as the, the real intent behind this entire bill. Um, I do intend to move these amendments knowing that they will fail uh, and I would urge the Scottish Government on the basis of the conversations we've had today and at stage two to look again at its eight-year-old commitment to put this right. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Richard Lockhead. Uh, my app signed out. I devoted no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lockhead. I'll make sure that is recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment 83 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes 28, no 80. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move to Group 10, Release on Licence of Short and Long-Term Prisoners. I call Amendment 37 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with uh, amendments as shown in the groupings. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 37 and speak to the other amendments in the group. I uh, move Amendment 37, President Officer. Section 7 of the Bill introduces a new temporary release licence for long-term prisoners. The Bill does not name the licence, but the term reintegration licence is used in the support and documentation, so I will use that term here. There was a detailed discussion in Section 7 during Stage 2, and I don't propose to rehearse all of those arguments here. I would, however, highlight at the outset that the intention of this licence is to support the reintegration of certain long-term prisoners, for example, helping them to link to community services and build a relationship with their supervising officer. In addition, release on this licence provides the opportunity for structured testing in the community, which will provide further evidence to the parole board to inform their decision-making. This approach is supported by the Chair of the Parole Board of Scotland. I appreciate there are questions about the introduction of a new temporary release licence. This is uh, to be expected and welcomed. And I welcomed the, the detailed and helpful debate about this section at Stage 2. For those in Chamber who did not hear the detailed discussion when this section was agreed to at Stage 2, I uh, would make two further points. Firstly, release on this licence will not be automatic. In the scenario where Scottish ministers can release a prisoner on this licence before their pro-qualifying date, that decision will be taken by SPS on the basis of risk assessment and consultation with the parole board. In the circumstances where the parole board may direct release on licence, they will already have considered the case and determined the individual suitable for release on parole. 
Prisoners released on this licence will be subject to two conditions which will include curfew, which can be electronically monitored and, importantly, supervised by justice social work. Secondly, the provision will not operate in isolation. The Bill requires the Scottish Ministers to prepare a statutory operating protocol to underpin the use of this licence. The operating protocol must detail the risk assessment process, which will inform release on this licence and the factors taken into account when undertaking these risk assessments. It will also cover matters such as how prisoners will be monitored when released on reintegration licence. I will now turn to the amendments. At stage two, Jamie Green lodged an amendment which sought to add the protection of the victim or victims of the prisoner or of a class of person to whom the prisoner may pose a risk to the existing list of considerations which the Scottish Ministers and the Parole Board must have regard before releasing a prisoner on this licence. I agreed with the principle of Mr Green's Stage 2 amendment, if not the specific drafting, and committed to bringing forward an amendment which would meet the same aim. Amendments 37 to 41 in my name deliver on that commitment. Those amendments add the protection of victims to the list of legal considerations to which the Scottish Ministers and Parole Board must have regard to when deciding to release on this licence. My amendments also include consideration of the protection of members of the victim's family and extend the protection of the public consideration to identifiable groups. Finally, my amendments also make sure this consideration is replicated for the short-term prisoners in the home detention curfew processes. Turning to Amendment 7, lodged by Russell Finlay, it is clear that we have the same outcome in mind. However, Mr Finlay's amendment does not include consideration of the protection of the victim's family and there is no comparable amendment for short-term prisoners subject to the HDC process. And I would therefore argue that my amendments go further and for that reason I would ask Mr Finlay not to move Amendment 7. Mr Finlay's Amendment 13 aims to prevent release on this licence until the individual reaches the halfway point of their sentence, the parole qualifying date or the PQD. The Bill currently provides that long-term prisoners can be temporarily released on this licence by the prison service up to 180 days in advance of their parole qualifying date. That is subject to risk assessment and consultation with the Parole Board, as I've already described. Removing the ability to temporarily release certain prisoners on this licence in advance of their PQD would negate one of the main benefits of this licence, and that is to provide further evidence to the Parole Board to inform their decision on whether or not to recommend uh, release at parole qualifying date. This approach is supported uh, by the Chair of the Parole Board, and I would therefore ask Mr Finlay not to press Amendment 13. Mr Finlay's Amendment 14 would limit the maximum period an individual could spend on this licence from 180 days to 8 days. One of the underpinning principles of this licence is to support the effective reintegration of long-term prisoners. For example, by providing the individual with the opportunity to make positive connections in their community and with support services. Scottish Prison Service can already allow appropriate individuals access to the community for short periods under the existing regime of temporary release. Where appropriate, Scottish Prison Service can permit periods of home leave up to a maximum of seven nights. In light of this, reducing the new temporary release licence to a maximum of eight days would simply duplicate the existing home leave arrangements. This amendment would undermine the intention of this licence, which is to provide a more sustained period of structured testing in the community to improve the prisoner's chances of a successful and safe reintegration. And I would therefore ask Mr Finlay not to press Amendment 14. Amendment 8, also in the name of Mr Finlay, seeks to add individuals who are subject to the sexual offences notification requirements to the list of statutory exclusions from release on this licence. This was also debated at stage two. Presiding officer, the list of existing statutory exclusions within the bill does not include offence-focused exclusions, and there are reasons for that. The approach in the bill is based on feedback we received during the consultation 
and from stakeholders that decisions about release should be based on risk assessment and not on the basis of offence type alone. I know that Mark McSherry, Chief Executive of the Risk Management Authority, also made that point to committee. As I've already previously highlighted, this provision has been designed with risk assessment at its core. The risk posed by all individuals being considered for this licence will be carefully assessed and considered as part of that process. That will use offence-specific risk assessments like those for people convicted of sexual offences where required. That will help to ensure the decisions to release on this licence are informed by all relevant information. Statutory exclusions on the basis of offence type alone cut across that, and therefore I would ask Mr Finlay not to press Amendment 8. Finally, Amendment 3, in the name of Russell Finlay, seeks to remove Section 7 from the Bill entirely. An identical amendment was lodged by Jamie Green at Stage 2, and while not moved to a vote, it was debated uh, thoroughly at committee. It will not surprise you that I do not support Amendment 3 uh, for all the reasons I previously given, and I would ask Mr Finlay not to press it. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Russell Finlay to speak to Amendment 7 and the other amendments in the group. Mr Finlay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got five amendments in this group, 7, 13, 14, 8 and 3, and they all relate to Section 7 of the Bill, which allows Scottish Ministers to re release prisoners on licence, even when the Parole Board has not recommended that they do so. Scottish Ministers can exercise this power before the prisoner has even reached halfway through their sentence. They can authorise the release of a prisoner on licence a full six months before they've even reached the halfway point. And the length of time that a prisoner can be released on licence is six months. What this means in practice is that a prisoner given a four-year sentence could spend 18 months in prison before being released on licence for a period of 180 days. This could be followed by a permanent release on licence after serving just half their sentence. This, I think, makes a bit of a mockery of sentencing and risks damaging public confidence in the process. It's worth noting that in the Scottish Government's initial consultation, there was a proposal that early release should be considered after just one third of all prison sentences. That's one third, with that being automatic for those of four years and less. Now, this particular proposal, which they floated, was withdrawn following Scottish Conservative pressure. And it's clear that the public were not on side with this. And I suspect that this proposal is a way for the Scottish Government to in introduce radical early release plans similar to the ones earlier proposed under the radar, effectively by stealth. That's why I'm proposing that this section should be removed altogether, which is what Amendment 3 would do. However, if the Scottish Government don't want to remove it entirely, then there are other options with the amendments in this group. Amendment 7 aims to ensure that victims' protection is considered when early release of a long-term prisoner is decided by Scottish Ministers or the Parole Board. And I'm very grateful to Victim Support Scotland for working with me on this amendment. And on the basis of what the Cabinet Secretary has said, just said, I do not intend to press Amendment 7. However, there are other amendments which I do think are important. Uh, the protection of a specific victim or group of people has been admitted from this bill by the Scottish Government. This seems like a strange oversight, although I note that the Scottish Government has uh, other amendments which may seek to address this, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary can explain this in summing up. In addition, the Scottish Government say the safety of a complainer should be considered in Section 2 of the bill. This relates to bail and remand decisions. We are saying that a complainer's safety should also be a consideration during release decision making. Returning to Amendment 13, this would remove the provision allowing Scottish Ministers or the Parole Board to release a prisoner on licence under this section 180 days before the halfway point of their sentence. Now, Amendment 14, a prisoner can be released temporarily for a period of up to eight days home leave. What the bill seeks to do is increase this temporary release period from eight days, which seems modest and reasonable, to 180 days, which is six full months. And I think this goes too far. This is another radical and far-reaching proposal 
which seeks to reduce prisoner numbers by stealth. If enacted unamended, I would go as far as saying that the act of sentencing risks becoming a sham which misleads the public and betrays crime victims. Now, finally, Amendment 8 would exempt prisoners who are on the sex offenders register from being eligible for this type of release. This amendment is also supported by Victim Support Scotland. So to recap, that being if the bill passes unamended, long-term prisoners can be released on licence for 180 days at a time. For the earlier stated reasons, this is wrong. For sex offenders, it is especially wrong. I would rather members backed Amendment 7, which removes this 180-day mechanism entirely. But if not, I'd urge, I would urge them to curb its worst excesses with my other amendments in, my, in, in this group. I'm glad that Amendment 7 has effectively been replicated and adopted by Scottish Government, but the other amendments are also worth pushing. Thank you. Thank you. I may call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to comment on just some of the amendments in this group. Firstly, Russell Findlay's desire to remove the whole of Section 7 with his Amendment 3 removes all of the provisions in the section that are expressly designed to better support the integration of certain long-term prisoners back into their communities. Providing prisoners with the opportunity to form positive connections with family, friends and others in their wider community with the help of support services is something that we know is important for reintegration following incarceration. And it helps reduce reoffending. It also promotes healthier relationships for all involved post-incarceration. This is something we should all welcome. This provision also provides the parole board with further evidence to inform their decision on whether or not to recommend release of a prisoner. The chair of the parole board has welcomed this. He told the Criminal Justice Committee that this, and I quote, will allow the board to direct temporary release on certain conditions if it recommends release on parole licence. It does not have that power just now. He also acknowledged the importance of better integration into post-prison life if a prisoner can talk to social work, addiction support, their general practitioner or others before the point of release on parole licence. We should retain this section as structured support that will help prisoners prepare for life after prison is vital. Therefore, I ask members to vote against amendment number three. For similar reasons and those outlined by the Cabinet Secretary, we also cannot support amendments 13 or 14. But finally, Presiding Officer, I welcome Russell Findlay's intention not to press amendment number seven. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jamie Green. <clears throat> thank you, Presiding Officer. Just briefly uh, in this group uh, to say two things. One is to first of all thank the Cabinet Secretary for responding to uh, the amendments I brought forward at stage two, uh, which are now reflected in amendments 37 to 41, which we will support and, and would encourage all members to support. Uh, and I'd like to put that on record. Um, I, I appreciate that at stage two often uh, we draft things in a way that we see appropriate, but often it's pointed out by the very large entourage in front of you at stage two that sometimes there are technical deficiencies in your drafting. Um, the same is probably true at stage three, unfortunately, as well, but such is the nature of how we legislate in this place. Um, on the more substantive points, though, around uh, this issue of release of long-term prisoners on licence, uh, is it an issue that we grappled with? It does seem to me, and I'm trying to reflect on this consider cons you know, considerably, is this massive jump between the status quo and what the government is proposing. 180 days, effectively six months, on a short, relatively short sentence is a, a disproportionate amount. I wondered why the government took this approach and not uh, a tapered approach, for example, that was relative to the length of the sentence. So effectively what Russ Finley was saying is that someone on a four-year sentence, which is generally the headline that you read uh, in the newspaper, uh, based on the assumption they would be uh, eligible for automatic other release after, uh, by two years into their sentence, but this, uh, this bringing forward by six months does reduce it in all intents and purposes to 18 months. Uh, now, I, I know when the government consulted on this, one of the questions that was put uh, was the potential to reduce automatic early release from 50% of the sentence to a third, which was a massive jump. I think it's fair to say that went down 
uh, quite poorly among stakeholders and it was quite quickly dropped from the drafting of the bill. But it sort of snuck in the back door because 18 months before your sentence is not far off a third if you look at it that way. I appreciate that it's under license, but I think it's something we have to reflect on, uh, which is why I think I'm uncomfortable with it, to be quite honest with you, and that's why I support uh, Russell Finlay's amendments in this vein. Thank you, and I call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Um, thank you, President Officer. Let me be clear. The provisions at Section 7 have been part of the Bill uh, since the Bill was introduced uh, and, of course, have been subject to full scrutiny. So I would, um, I would take exception uh, to the notion that this uh, provision has been sneaked in. I would just like to emphasise a, a few points, President Officer, that this new reintegration licence um, is not automatic and it's for up to 180 days. The important point about it being um, only available to long-term determinate prisoners, so it's not a licence for uh, life sentence prisoners, but the reality is for long-term determinate prisoners, they will be released. And therefore, it is appropriate that we have a number of uh, tools um, in order to prepare prisoners for that release. As I said, this is not an automatic um, entitlement. In fact, um, it, it may only um, benefit between 75 and 200 uh, prisoners um, at any one time. Um, risk assessment is absolutely core. Um, yes, briefly, please. Russell Finlay. Just to uh, think it's worth, again, pointing out how helpful it would have been as members of the Criminal Justice Committee if we had the kind of data and statistics the Cabinet Secretary has just quoted to us in defence of her bill. It would have made our job much more easy. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, presiding officer, the figures that I have quoted about the number of prisoners anticipated uh, to have potentially um, access to this reintegration licence is actually taken from the policy memorandum. Yeah. Um, and I am quite sure that all members of the Justice Committee will be well acquainted uh, with the policy memorandum uh, which accompanied uh, this bill. So I'm afraid, presiding officer, I have not made any startling uh, revelation uh, to chamber today. It is important, uh, presiding officer, that uh, the focus of our deliberations is around risk assessment and consultation with the parole board. And one of the commitments that I did make to committee at stage two was to keep them fully informed in terms of how the standing operating procedure uh, would uh, develop. Um, presiding officer, we, we have to um, have the courage to acknowledge that successfully preparing prisoners for release and reintegration leads to better rehabilitation and that leads to better uh, community safety. I would dispute that this proposition is particularly radical. It is, of course, uh, learnt from uh, some experience um, elsewhere in Europe in terms of the, the Netherlands and Norway. And I know that some members of committee certainly uh, cast an eye uh, to that broader European experience where they have um, achieved better results uh, with the rehabilitation of offenders. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 37. Cabinet Secretary, move on up. Move, Mr. Officer. Thank you. The question is that uh, Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 37. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 40 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already, agree, uh, already debated with Amendment 37. Cabinet Secretary, move or not move? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Russell Finlay. Already debated with Amendment 37. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Uh, not moved. It is not moved. The question... Uh, I call Amendment 13 in the name of Russell Finlay. Already debated with Amendment 37. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
And the vote is closed. The result of the vote on Amendment 13 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 28, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Russell Finlay. Already debated with Amendment 37. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Uh, I call Amendment 8 in the name of Russell Finlay. Already debated with Amendment 37. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? All that's not agreed, there'll be a division, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 8 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 28, no, 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Call Amendment 41 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 37. Cabinet Secretary, move or not move? Moved. Question is that Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 37. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. We're going to move on to Group 11, powers uh, to block release. Um, I'd invite uh, call Amendment... Uh, 84 in the name of Jamie Green in a group on its own. Jamie Green to move uh, and speak to Amendment 84. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, can I uh, thank members for their forbearance? It's been a long day, but uh, Group 11 uh, has one amendment in it, and it's a very uh, specific issue. And it's, I, I imagine it's, it's quite a sensitive issue, and, and I hope you'll bear with me as I uh, explain it. Um, I make no apologies for bringing this issue uh, to the Chamber today. This is a bail about bail and release, and this very much is an issue about release in a very specific circumstance. Um, and I hope members will bear with me uh, on this. It's also an issue which is important to me personally because it does feature uh, and did feature my own consultation around, around a member's bill, uh, my own victim's bill. This part of my consultation. Uh, was more commonly known under the guise of Suzanne's Law, which I know is something that's just featured uh, in the Chamber over the years. Um, when I consulted on this issue, and it was a more broad issue rather than a solution to the situation, I posed the following questions. Which of the following best expresses your view on the proposed aims of implementing Suzanne's Law, whereby an offender convicted of murder could be denied release on the grounds that they have failed to disclose the location of the victim's body, which really is the essence of what Suzanne's law is. Uh, the response was overwhelming and quite clear. 85% of those who uh, took part in my consultation uh, partially or fully supported the proposal. I know this is an issue actually that the Scottish Government historically has been keen to address, and I give them credit for that, but for that alone. Um, Hamza Youssef was the Justice Secretary back in 2019. Uh, and he announced 
that he would be introducing uh, a form of Suzanne's law. Now, laws are not laws until we see them in black and white. I do understand that. But often when uh, government ministers make promises as such, then they are received by the public as such. Um, at that time, it was, I think, welcome, welcomed uh, and well-received. Uh, Kate Wallace, uh, Victim Support Scotland, said, we welcome this announcement, uh, which includes the introduction of Suzanne's law. So I think that sets the groundwork here that there was an expectation that the government was moving in a certain direction. In fact, the Scottish government more recently went as far as consulting more with the parole board, and I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about this from the cabinet secretary, on what could be done. Uh, in February of this year, the Scottish Government issued a press release which effectively lauded its moves to introduce uh, Suzanne's law, and I've got a copy of that release here. But when you scratch below the surface, and that, rele that release uh, did hit the headlines. Um, it was a, a well-read BBC news story for quite some time. But it was only after it was released uh, was I contacted by some of the families that this scenario affects. And they were frankly disappointed because when you do scratch below the surface, it is clear that the solution being offered at the time was far from ideal and certainly did not go far enough in delivering the promise that was promised. In fact, it didn't really go anywhere because if you look back at our Criminal Justice Committee papers on the 8th of February, uh, I did seek clarification on what the Pro Board changes would mean in practice. And it states that it clearly clarifies that the disclosing of the whereabouts of a victim's body may be considered where relevant, but does not change the underlying test for release applied by the board in such cases. So it felt to me, and, and actually to the families that contacted me, like a massive fudge. For me, uh, an offender who refuses to reveal the location of their victim's body when they know where that exists, at the moment they can still be released on the, under the current rules, and it bears very little effect onto the decision making. I think Sorry, this is a, a quite a sensitive subject. I hope members will bear with me on this. I know it's late in the day. But when a family loses a loved one to murder, I think the simplest comfort we can offer them is disclosing information about where their loved one may rest so they can put them to rest properly. And Suzanne's law is called Suzanne's law for a very good reason. Uh, Suzanne Pilly was murdered by her colleague, and that comfort of being able to bury Suzanne is one that her family are yet to realise. I don't know if they will ever be able to. And they're not the only one. Her murderer will be eligible for parole in the next couple of years. So this is a live issue. And I'm grateful that it doesn't affect many people, but it does affect those that it does affect. Amendment 84 in my name in this group is one of the opportunities I've tried to come up with that I think resolve this issue. Um, I suspect, in fact, the Pro Board were quite clear that meaningful introduction of anything like Suzanne's Law can actually only be achieved through legislative change. This is perhaps that potential change. My amendment states quite simply that in exercising its function under the 1993 Act, which does afford it the duty to release discretionary life prisoners, we add one simple and additional vital test, and that is the following, that the Board is satisfied that the prisoner concerned has no information about where or how their victims' remains were disposed of, which that person has not disclosed. Knowingly not disclosed. Not unable to, not forgetful, but knowingly not disclosed. What this is not, this amendment, to be clear before uh, I am accused of it, is not the introduction of whole life sentences through the back door. This is about the power of release and the Pro Board's uh, decision-making process. Neither is it a definitive bar on releasing someone uh, contrary to any perceived uh, human rights that they may hold, and I've heard all the arguments imaginable on, on that, and I understand them. But what this amendment does do is it ensures that the board is wholly satisfied that the offender is not willingly, in their opinion, withholding that information. And I'm afraid to say there are other stories like Suzanne's out there, and it will only affect a small minority of people. But the insufferable pain of seeing the murderer released on parole on license, when they know that we know that he or she knows where the victim is, I think is unacceptable. In response to my amendment today, a number of organisations wrote a joint statement on it and they said the following, we are strongly supportive of Jamie Green's proposed amendment to the Prisoner and Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act 1993. 
Uh, both Victim Support Scotland support for families briefed by Crime Service are acutely aware of the suffering and anguish victims' families face when they are denied this information by the perpetrator. As such, this amendment has the potential to have a significant impact on the experience of families bereaved by that crime. I'm just going to ask the following of members uh, in the chamber. Let's do the right thing here. We have heard far too many warm words over the years, well-intended, well-meaning, but that deliver nothing. Let's deliver something meaningful. And if the government does choose to reject, perhaps even sensibly and for technical reasons or respectfully, I do ask at the very least they will come up with a proposal of their own in its place. Thank you. Thank you. I now call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. And can I also start by acknowledging that this is uh, a live issue uh, for, for families and it is a deeply uh, sensitive issue and uh, I'm not for a minute uh, going to uh, cast any aspersions that the member in bringing this forward um, has only done so with the, the, the very best of reasons. And I also appreciate that Amendment 84 speaks to an issue which Jamie Green and others have raised previously in this chamber, including uh, with myself, um, although it specifically hasn't been raised uh, during the passage of this bill. But nonetheless, I know that it is an issue that Mr Green and many others feel very strongly about. And I do share his concern for the families of murder victims who are not able to properly say goodbye to their loved ones and lay them at peace. I think it would be difficult to imagine anything worse. Amendment 84 would require the parole board uh, do not recommend the release of a life sentence prisoner unless they are satisfied that the prisoner has no information that they have not previously disclosed about how or where their victim's remains were disposed of. I would say to the member that the parole board already takes matters such as this into account when considering release. They have also done so and for very, very good reasons. Because not disclosing where the remains of the deceased, the victim, are, is of course highly germane to someone's progress or not in rehabilitation and their insight or not uh, into their past behaviour. So it's highly, highly relevant. But to put that beyond doubt, a specific provision was added to the parole board rules to make it clear that failure to reveal a victim's remains is a matter that the parole board may take into account when deciding a person's release from prison. And that did come into force on April 2023. And I have listened to what the member uh, has, has shared in respect to that. But there is a legislative basis to parole board rules. And I know that for many people, they will continue to campaign for that to go further. Before I go into um, all the reasons that Mr Green would expect me to go into around um, ECHR and, yes, some of the drafting issues with, with the, the amendment, if I can just make um, another um, broader point to, to acknowledge that uh, I think we're all acutely aware this is about grieving families and, and, and humans. And, you know, I'm conscious that I'm about to go into some of the more um, technical reasons. Where there are genuine difficulties, not just for Scotland, but also in the changes that they made in England, because I had a, a close look, not to um, compare and contrast in a pejorative or in a negative way. It's just it's the nearest jurisdiction um, to, to this country. And again, I think they have wrestled with many of, of the issues uh, that we you know, will currently um, wrestle with. So while some of the language in England um, is, is a little bit different, it's a different uh, jurisdiction, what it doesn't alter is the underlying risk-based test for the release of a prisoner and what it does not mean is that a prisoner who does not disclose the information will not be released. And as with many factors in the justice system, 
or indeed in and around uh, the release of prisoners as soon as you move to something that is far more definitive and far more absolute and far more prescriptive, you then will see all of these ECHR issues, etc., kick in. Whereas if matters are crafted in a way that gives discretion to the Pro Board, while that may seem unsatisfactory, it may actually be um, a, a stronger position to have. So if, if the Chamber will forgive me, President Officer, I'm going to go through all of these um, less than uh, inhumane um, reasons, but I, I do think it is important that, that I do so, uh, not least that people will, of course, want to consider um, matters further for now and in the future. So it's important that I put some matters on the record. The amendment would cover all life sentence prisoners, including those who have not been convicted of murder. Therefore, as drafted, it would be too wide a reach, and that may also lead to uncertainty as to how it operates in practice. It is also not clear how the board would be satisfied that the prisoner had no information about the whereabouts of the remains of their victim, and I'm not clear what that test uh, would be, what the test would be for that. As I've alluded to, there may also be significant ECHR concerns. Article 3 um, requires a life sentence uh, to include safeguards against indefinite definition without the possibility of release. That's the possibility of release. It doesn't mean that everyone is or should be released. And Mr Green's proposal, which would require a prisoner to be held indefinitely until they provide certain information. Um, notwithstanding that, they may not know um, or remember the information in question, and that may be a, a direct controversy of Article 3. But, of course, I hear what Mr Green said uh, with, re with regards to uh, what, what he articulated his amendment was not doing. Um, it also suggests prisoners would be detained for longer than the punishment part imposed by the court with no possibility of parole due to a lack of cooperation. So that takes us back to some of the sentencing issues. And that, of course, may raise issues of arbitrary detention contrary to, to Article 5 and may interfere with the right to silence, which is protected by Article 6. Um, in, in, in my view, I think decisions on release um, are best taken by expert members um, of, of the Parole Board, uh, having taken account of all relevant information. Uh, and, of course, information uh, such as this uh, is indeed relevant for the reasons that I've outlined. Um, I would also note that the failure to disclose the location of a body can already be prosecuted as a criminal offence of attempting to, to defeat the ends of justice. The court can and will also take into account the refusal to disclose the location of a body when sentencing. So it is for, for all those reasons that, um, that I've outlined above that I don't support this particular amendment, and I would um, ask Mr Green not to, to press it. But I want to end by saying, President Officer, that I do acknowledge the, the human considerations and the suffering that Mr Green has outlined, and uh, I will always remain alert to the opportunities to provide further comfort and redress to families who live with unimaginable pain. I don't know what those opportunities would be. I'm not going to lead anybody uh, up the garden path or make false promises. Um, but I'm sure I and others uh, will want to remain alert uh, to the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jamie Green to wind up and press a withdraw Amendment 84. Mr. Green. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her comments? I appreciate uh, what I'm not going to do in summing up is debate the technicalities of why the amendment is flawed. Uh, I appreciate that I can, you know, I, I can see them for myself. Um, but I guess there are limitations to what you can do uh, at stage three with something like that. Uh, an issue is, is, is wide-ranging as that. I think the Cabinet Secretary made a very interesting point in that sometimes there are many roads lead to the same destination. And, I, and I'm quite content with that. And I think the families would be content that... Um, sometimes the most direct route, which is the bluntest instrument available to us, may be the one that creates the most roadblocks along the way for all the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned. 
Um, and I don't want that to be the case. I, I'm comfortable that if the road is slightly longer but still gets there, that's fine. And I'm sure that would be fine for those families as well. So I, I take com some comfort in that. But I guess I want to make a final point on this. And that's, I appreciate that the proof will be very much in the pudding. Uh, when these offenders do come up for that parole decision, time will tell whether what has changed in terms of guidelines or any perceived strengthening or lack of, of the parole board's decision making, we will know when the time comes whether it has been effective or not. But is there any merit in not waiting until that point when these individuals are up for parole? And I say that for a very specific reason. Is there any merit, for example, if that offender is sitting in their cell and they know now that the failure to disclose that information may be a major factor uh, that, that states they will not be released on parole and therefore would be more likely or more willing to release that information now. I think it's, we don't want to wait and see. What the families want isn't really about changing the law for changing the law's sake. What the families want is to get the information that discloses the whereabouts of their loved ones. In any way we can do that. And if it's via the carrot and stick model, as I seem to be going down, or if it's through any other model, I'm not sure that that fussed. All I would ask is, is that if my amendment doesn't achieve it, if the government doesn't sound like it's, it's bringing forward any other primary legislation to achieve it, what else can we do? And what other comforts can we collectively provide those families, which is why I brought it to the chamber today. I thank members for uh, listening uh, to this um, important subject, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will be willing to work with me and any other member on this as we move forward and meet any of the families who wish to do so, to afford them some comfort that this is an issue that the Parliament takes seriously, that the Government takes seriously, and that we'll do what we can. We will all collectively do what we can to offer them that closure that I think they need and they, they, they really do deserve, presiding officer. And for that reason, I will not move Amendment 84. Thank you, Mr Green. Mr. Thank you, Jamie Green. Seeks to uh, withdraw Amendment 84. Does any um, member object? There's no objection. Thank you. We move on to Group 12, uh, Power to Release Early. Uh, I call Amendment 42 in the name of Jamie Green, uh, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jamie Green to move Amendment 42 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Mr Green. Well, that was the consensual bit out of the way, so <laughs> now we move on to Group 12. Power to release early uh, and back to the politics of it all, uh, starting off, sir. Um, this group uh, relates to a ministerial power, which is in Section 8 of the bill, which effectively uh, gives Scottish ministers the power to release prisoners early. And by that, um, I don't mean uh, early release in the way that we talked about in other groups uh, or discretionary release on licence, actual open the doors release. Um, the Scottish Government in this section is affording itself a permanent power to release prisoners in a situation which deems to be necessary at short notice and in this case possibly with no parliamentary authority or scrutiny and with conditions and exemptions attached to it to sum it up. I think anyone who watched the stage two debate on this will attest to the um, amusing, slightly bizarre exchange that we had uh, with the Cabinet Secretary. I think I first of all want to question what is this power really needed for? Once we've ascertained that, then I think it's easier for Parliament to decide whether they afford ministers the power in the first place. Section 8, as drafted, actually creates some massive loopholes, which I'm going to explain. Um, when I asked the Cabinet Secretary um, why this power was needed, uh, it, the claim was made that this provision was necessary, and I quote, for example, in the event of a major fire in a prison, which is entirely reasonable. In fact, anyone who read the news this morning will have heard the very unfortunate and actually horrific case of a fire uh, in Central America, a women's prison where uh, a large number of inmates, I think it was 40 perhaps more that we know of, uh, uh, died as a result of a fire in a prison. So um, I do understand it's a very real scenario. It hasn't happened, thankfully, in this country. Um, but we do know, that certainly in other jurisdictions, issues like rioting, for example, have created fires and, and are very live issues when temperaments rise. 
So that's all very reasonable enough, and I think it would be unreasonable for members to not afford ministers that power. But the problem is the section, this section of the bill goes on to state quite a vast array of exemptions to that power. Because on one hand, ministers are affording themselves the power to emergency release some prisoners, but in doing so have also banned themselves from releasing others. There are certain categories of prisoners who cannot be released in such a scenario. For example, life prisoners, untried prisoners, those who have more than 180 days left to serve their sentence, and terrorist prisoners, for example, to name a few. Which does beg the question, if the reason for these powers is that they are completely necessary and needed by ministers in an unforeseen and probably quite dramatic emergency, such as a flood, a fire, uh, riots, perhaps even a disease, which I'll come on to, then why on earth would you have exemptions? It does not make any sense. And in any case, if there is such an emergency scenario in a prison, it begs me to ask a further question, which is why there is not already well-established protocols which deal with such a problem. The solution is not simply to throw open the doors. Now, in our wide-ranging discussion at stage two, the example of the COVID scenario came up because that's the one that we faced the Parliament most recently when these powers were entirely relevant. Um, members know that we afforded ministers these extraordinary powers uh, of emergency release in emergency legislation. And we were very quick to pass that legislation. Those of, of us who were here will, will recall that. I think at the time we all knew fine well that those powers would be extended and extended further, and so they were. And lo and behold, those powers still exist. They do have a shelf life, I understand that, which perhaps is one of the drivers uh, behind the permanency of these powers. But I would argue, quite simply, that if the government wants a power of this nature, it can bring it forward in emergency legislation should we ever face an extraordinary emergency situation like COVID again. So again, it's entirely unclear as to what this permanent power is needed for, because there are contradictions in it. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary the following questions, which I think have been left unaddressed. Um, first of all, is why is there no current contingency protocol to deal with life-threatening emergencies in prisons? If, is there a legislative vacuum which does exist, which necessitates this power? And if that's the case, if that power already exists, then why are we adding to it with this bill? Because that has been unclear to date. If there is a power needed to urgently save lives in an unprecedented emergency, then why are there exemptions? And is there any risk, and I'm saying this genuinely, not politically, is there any, ris any risk whatsoever that this power could be used in any other circumstance than a life-threatening emergency? And that is to say, is there anything in the legislation which states that ministers could use this power to release a prisoner that it deems fit, perhaps contrary to the views of the Parliament, given that there will be no scrutiny in that scenario, and probably contrary to either professional or public opinion, in that case, I mean the Pro Board governors or others. And I don't think we need to look far into the history of some prisons, one very near my hometown, uh, where one high-profile prisoner was released by a government and the controversy that that can and does attract. If the government can make a clear case for the power, then the Parliament should afford it that power. Um, as always, I've got a, a number of amendments which seem to take different approaches. Amendment 4 simply removes Section 8 altogether. I understand that's probably quite a blunt instrument, and I suspect the Cabinet Secretary will ask members not to support it. Amendment 44, however, takes a slightly different tack, and I think we should consider it. It removes the powers of Scottish ministers to be able to release prisoners due to an event or situation which has resulted in any prison or part of a prison to which the regulations would relate being unusable. And the reason for that is it simply doesn't make sense in this, to, for the regulations to be used in this way because the regulations uh, are also being used to prevent quite a large category of prisoners from being released. I would argue that if a prison or any part of a prison becomes unusable, unusable then that should apply to all prisoners to which that emergency directly affects and surely there is capacity within the state uh, otherwise to, to move those people not simply to release them under emergency powers. I think it's quite an illogical provision. Uh, Amendment 42 uh, makes it clear that a person should have it served at least half their sentence uh, 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 before any such release can take place. Um, if that's repetition of other amendments or what the government perceives to be already in the bill, then I'd happily withdraw that one. And Amendment 45 
um, is one which I hope I will get support, if not from the government, from other opposition parties, and that's that if the government uh, uh, will at least consult with Parliament via a vote on any such decision, um, it removes the Scottish Government's ability to release prisoners without a parliamentary vote. And I don't think there really are any circumstances that I can foresee where a group of prisoners are released en masse in response to emergency without some form of parliamentary intervention. And that can take uh, many shapes and forms, as we proved quite frequently and often during the COVID pandemic. I certainly was part of many a vote dialed in uh, on Zoom in these matters. We can do it at short notice. We can do it the next morning if required. Um, I think the government can choose to find other options. Um, the government, of course, often cite that some, you know, these, these powers will exist in England and Wales in relation to emergency release. So I did some uh, looking at that as well. And of course, other jurisdictions do afford themselves limited powers to release prisoners early in emergency situations. They've had those powers actually for four decades, but they've not used those powers. And that's a stark contrast with what happened here mm -hmm. in Scotland. The last time that power was used, 348 prisoners were emergency early released from Scottish prisons. 40% of them reoffended within six months. That quite simply creates more victims and uh, more backlogging over courts. I would just ask that we learn from mistakes on that. I want the government to learn from their mistakes on that, whatever the reasons. Um, Amendments 65 and 66 uh, carry on from that theme. Um, I would argue that there already must be very robust Scottish prison service procedures and protocols for dealing with this type of scenario. Um, one of these scenarios, for example, is the incidence or spread of infection, contamination, or the source of contamination which presents significant harm to human health in Scotland. And the other one is that of an event or situation which has result in any prison being unusable. Uh, the, the Scottish Government, despite repeated uh, requests, has been able, unable to demonstrate why the current Scottish SPS procedures are insufficient for dealing with these scenarios. Uh, worse still, uh, and if it is for reason of public health, then why on earth did we release prisoners from prison, which is a contained environment by its very nature, into the community without testing them for COVID? I mean, that happened. Uh, so the public health argument is one which didn't stack up last time it was used either which is why Amendment 66 provides a safeguard uh, and whilst it adds to the reporting requirements of Section 14, is very relevant to the powers that the government's ministers want in Section 8. I, if the government won't ditch the power, which I suspect it won't, and it won't agree to tidying up the powers, and it won't even agree to let us having a vote on it, then at the very least they must explain why the current provisions, which they claim are so unsatisfactory, are indeed so unsatisfactory, and which will give credence to these new powers. And in closing, there is a massive difference between early release and emergency release. And I think the government needs to be clear about the use of either of those. What will this power look like in the real world? In my view, and I've looked at this section many times, it is still a bit of a mess, even at stage three. And no one has sought to tidy up its many contradictions, which is why I have attempted to do so today. And given this is the last amendment that I'll speak to uh, in this group and also probably in the rest of the groups and for the rest of this evening. Uh, I just want to thank the colleagues for um, listening to our arguments and, 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 and voting accordingly. But in doing so, ahead of tomorrow's stage three debate, I would like to refer members to their inboxes. And there's a, a, an important email in there from uh, a number of organizations who've written a joint statement to all members in the chamber. And I would ask them to go home and reflect on that. Uh, with regards to their voting intentions tomorrow, and namely that email will appear in your inbox from Victim Support Scotland, Assist Scot Scottish Women's Aid and, and others. Uh, and I would appeal to members before, as they reflect on, on the events of this evening, um, think very carefully about how they vote tomorrow in the final vote at stage three. And that's, uh, I wanted to use this opportunity to ra raise awareness of that. Um, but anyway, I'll listen to see what other members in the Cabinet Secretary has to say in response. Thank you, Mr. Green. I probably should have advised the Chamber uh, ahead of moving into this group that once we've dispensed with the amendments in this group, and there'll be a, a further um, short comfort break. Um, I now call Russell Finlay to speak to uh, Amendment 85 and other amendments in the group. Mr. Finlay. Uh, thank you. For the sake of uh, brevity and late night, I'll f talk only to my own amendment in this group, which is uh, number uh, 85. Now, um, uh, Jamie Green's already spoken to his six amendments. 
and I wholeheartedly agree with his uh, very thoughtful and considered position, which was typically well explained. Frankly, I find it it's unclear why ministers are seeking this power to release prisoners in an emergency, but it, I find it then strange to exempt certain types of prisoners. And as Jamie Green's already touched upon, this includes terrorists, sex offenders, domestic abusers, those serving life sentences, those facing extradition, and those yet to stand trial. Now, the most obvious solution to this is to back Jam Jamie Green's amendment number eight, which would scrap section eight entirely. Um, he describes this as a blunt instrument, but it certainly does the job. But if the Scottish Government reject this, then they should, in they should instead support his other amendments, which seek to improve this section. And whether they choose to do that or not, I would argue that they should add another type of offender to the emergency release exemption list, that category being fraudsters. Now, President Officer, I recognise that this may be a sensitive subject for some members right now, but those who commit crimes of dishonesty should be exempted from emergency release in exactly the same way as the previously stated six categories of prisoners. And I therefore move that amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now uh, call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 43 and the other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Section 8 is an essential provision that cannot and should not be removed uh, from this bill. Um, I would like to start by addressing Amendment 4 in the name of Jamie Green. Uh, that amendment seeks to remove Section 8 from the bill in its entirety. And this amendment was lodged by Katie Clark and debated at Stage 2. I'm not surprised to see it back again. Um, I'm not disappointed either because actually I, I do think it's powers like this that should be debated actually in, in peacetime and, and not when we are in the, 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 the face of an emergency. And actually it does give a better all-rounded opportunity uh, for, for any learning um, of past endeavours. While Ms Clark uh, didn't move the amendment in her name at stage two, I did speak in detail about the need for this prov provision. As this amendment uh, has been raised again, I will set out again why such provision is necessary and I will do my best to provide as much clarity as is possible, being in mind I do not have a crystal ball, uh, and um, answer uh, questions too. Um, in order to ensure the security and good order of our prisons and the health and safety of prisoners and prison staff, it is imperative that we have a mechanism in place to respond immediately to emergencies within our prisons. The power to release early in this bill is intended to provide a means to release groups of prisoners if the impact that an emergency situation is having or is likely to have puts the security of prisons or the safety or welfare of prisoners or prison staff at risk. Put bluntly, it's if lives are at risk. The prison service have robust mechanisms in place to deal with changes in circumstances within custody. That is not what this provision is for. This is intended to be used in extremis in the event of an emergency situation that, with the best will in the world, could not be predicted. And I will highlight again that this is not a power I would ever hope to use, but we have included it in this bill because, as the pandemic showed us, we have to be able to respond to the unpredictable. Unlike the UK government, who have had a comparable, and I would argue, wider power since the 1980s, Scottish ministers currently have no legal power to instruct early release to protect the security and good order of pr prisons and the safety and welfare of prisoners and staff, other than specifically in response to COVID. So I would contend that there currently is a, a legislative gap. Without the provision in Section 8 of this Bill, we would be required to introduce emergency legislation if we needed to respond to an emergency situation in our prisons in order to protect lives. For example, in the event of a 
major fire that is life-threatening in a prison or an outbreak of a life-threatening infection or contamination, even emergency legislation would take time and it could be time that we just can't afford if we are to save lives. At stage two, the Criminal Justice Committee agreed to amend the bill to extend the Governor's veto in relation to this power to include instances where it is felt that a prisoner who would otherwise be released might pose a risk of harm to an identified group of people. This adds a further um, safeguard to this power. And tied to this and taking account of discussions at stage two, Amendment 43 in my name introduces guidance on the application of the Governor's veto. This is intended to ensure consistency of practice across the prison estate, offering prison governors support on how the veto power will operate in practice if it was ever required. Um, to pick up on some of Mr Green's other issues, uh, obviously any um, decision that was made under these emergency powers would still, albeit retrospectively, if it was made under the made affirmative procedure, would still require scrutiny akin to uh, SSIs and it would be for Parliament to decide whether emergency powers or decisions uh, were continued uh, beyond uh, 28 days. Um, and if I can emphasise the, the, the point that provision, um, the point that Mr Green raised is about creating space in the estate, uh, for example, self-isolating and an infection. So it's, um, you, know, th this, you know, the SPS have capacity uh, to, to manage these issues. This is not what this um, amendment or section in the bill is about. And the point about statutory exclusions, which I... Um, recall we did have quite um, an exchange um, about but the, the, the sensible point is that statutory exclusions apply because of the urgency with which this power would necessarily be used it would not be possible to undertake individualized risk assessments in such an emergency but obviously the exceptions and the, the governor veto um, does exist if I can turn to Amendment 42 in the name of Jamie Green, this amendment would add a requirement that only those prisoners who have served one half of their sentence and who have 180 days or less to serve would be eligible in any round of emergency release. The emergency release power contained in the bill already has, as I've indicated, a number of statutory exclusions which essentially limit eligibility to those serving short-term sentences and those long-term prisoners whose release at the halfway point of their sentence has been recommended by the Parole Board. Under Section 1 of the Prisoners and Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act 1993, a short-term prisoner, short prisoner sorry, are already released at the point that they have served half of their sentence. And the Parole Board can only recommend a long-term prisoner for release on parole licence at the halfway point of their sentence at the earliest. So I am unclear who then Mr Green thinks could be eligible. Um, so this amendment seems designed to severely limit the number of prisoners who would be eligible uh, to be released. And, and perhaps maybe that's the point of Mr Green's um, amendment. But that will be for, for him to, to clarify. I consider that the additional criteria that was accepted at stage two, that is limiting the eligibility to those with 180 days or less left to serve when taken with the existing statutory exclusions and the governor veto provides sufficient safeguards uh, to use uh, to, to the use of this power. So as such, I would ask Mr Green not to move Amendment 42. I now turn to Amendment 85 in the name of Russell Finlay. This would add to the, the list of exclusions from eligibility for release under the power anyone who is currently serving a period of imprisonment for fraud. A definition for what constitutes fraud is not provided, i.e. whether this would include uh, only crimes under common law, definition of fraud or other crimes of dishonesty such as uttering embezzlement or if it includes the wide range of statutory frauds. Aside from this, it is not considered that the inclusion in the list of statutory exclusions is uh, necessary in, in any event. If any person is felt to pose a risk to a victim or identified group of people, then the release can be blocked using the Governor's power of veto. 
As such, I do not consider this amendment as necessary and would ask Mr Finlay not to move. Turning to Amendment 44 in the name of Jamie Green, this changes the definition of emergency situation currently contained in the Bill to prevent the power being used as an event or situation which has resulted in any prison or part of a prison being unusable. As outlined earlier, this is not a power we would expect to use lightly. I appreciate the concerns Mr Green outlined at Stage 2 that Scottish Ministers it may use this power in situations which fall short of his idea of an emergency. How, however, I can assure him that that is not the, the intention um, and I think it is important that I put that on the record. If the Scottish Ministers were not able to release prisoners in the event of a prison or part of it becoming unusable and unsafe for prisoners and staff, such as in the event of a fire, flood or structural collapse, the Scottish Ministers would be forced to relocate those prisoners to elsewhere in the estate. This could bring with it a range of logistical issues, such as challenges in the housing of different categories of prisoners, and could it potentially jeopardise the security and good order of a prison, presenting a risk to both prisoners and prison staff. The comparable power available to the UK Government could potentially be exercised in situations where a prison or part of a prison has become unusable. This would be dependent on the circumstances of the situation as a whole, eh, as would the exercise of the power in the Bill being considered today. As such, it is important that we retain this limb of the definition of an emergency situation, and for that reason I ask Mr Green not to move Amendment 44. I now turn to Amendment 45 in the name of Jamie Green. This amendment would remove the ability of Scottish Ministers to use the made affirmative procedure for the emergency release regulations in situations of urgency. This would significantly impair the Government's ability to take immediate, necessary and proportionate action to ensure the safety and security of prisons. For that reason, I cannot support it. The Delegated Powers and Legislative Reform Committee quite rightly scrutinised the use of the made affirmative in this bill and the Scottish Government provided them uh, with further detail to inform that scrutiny. I note that the DPLRC's response to this, uh, committee, to this committee on the Delegated Powers Memorandum to this bill, they stated that the majority of the committee is content with the explanation provided by the Scottish Government and accepts the power in principle. The majority of the committee is also content that the exercise of the power will be subject to the affirmative procedure, but may be subject to the made affirmative in specified circumstances and by reason of urgency. And again, I would therefore ask Mr Green not to press Amendment 45. Um, lastly, President Officer, turning to Amendments 65 and 66, in the name of Mr Green. These amendments would require that this section not be brought into force until ministers have prepared and published a report on the SPS procedures for responding to the emergency situations listed in the Bill and explain why these procedures do not adequately ensure the security and good order of the prisons of health, safety and welfare of the prisoners and staff. This is um, tantamount to publishing a report to explain why this power is necessary, something we have debated in this chamber um, a few times now. And I think I have made it clear that if we were to hold off commencing this power in order to publish such a report as specified in this amendment, there is a possibility that an emergency situation could arise and we may be powerless uh, to act quickly enough. I do not consider that this report is necessary. I would again point out that the UK Government have had a comparable power since the early 1980s and this power brings us in, into line with them. And I would urge Mr Green not to move amendments 65 and 66. Thank you. I now call Jamie Green uh, to wind up and to press a withdrawal amendment 42. Mr Green. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for um, what I thought was a predictable response uh, to my concerns. Um, I, I, I was generally quite surprised. I, I, many of the questions I posed were, were, were for good reason. Uh, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary said, it's better to have this debate in times of peace than in times of emergency. We really didn't have time to debate some of this the last time we were asked to make quite drastic decisions. And I think decisions that many of us were quite uncomfortable with at the time and, and were quite vocal about that. So it's good we've had this debate. I do find it extraordinary, though, that there is a massive legislative gap at the moment that says that Scottish ministers currently have no emergency power to release in any uh, in extremist circumstance, as the Cabinet Secretary put it, which does 
you know, conjure up a, a, a slightly worrying image uh, that if there was a wholesale massive issue, such as a huge fire in Barlini or Greenock or Sauton or elsewhere, that, that there are very few options available to ministers at the moment and that protocol is, uh, in, is not satisfactory at the moment, which is why this power is needed. But even under the proposed new solution, it still seems to be, I, I think, a, a, a bizarre contradictory situation where prisoners are segregated according to type of offence and those of a certain category will be rehoused elsewhere in the prison state and others will be eligible for release, which is my interpretation of, of the proposal. It still doesn't make a huge amount of sense. But nonetheless, uh, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. The one that is my bugbear, which I'm going to move in this uh, group, is Amendment 45, because that's the issue of parliamentary scrutiny on it, and I think that's the one that is actually important. You know, we, we can hy hypothecate quite a lot about scenarios and hopefully we'll never have to deal with those scenarios. But if we do ever have to deal with those scenarios, I would like to think that the government and this parliament has a wherewithal to pull together quickly in that scenario to decide uh, whether ministers should be opening the doors of our prisons, given the consequences of what happened last time, which I know the cabinet secretary didn't address in, in her comments. So I will push uh, that, but on amendment 42, I will withdraw. Thank you. Um, the uh, Jeremy, uh, Jamie Green uh, seeks to withdraw Amendment 42. Does any other member object? There's no objection. Thank you very much. I call Amendment 85 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 42. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, the Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Claire Baker. Can we have Claire Baker's microphone? Point of order, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am unable to uh, connect to the robust <laughs> voting system. I would have voted yes. I'll make sure that is recorded, Mr Mountain. Point of order, clear. Uh, apologies for delay, President Officer. Um, I couldn't connect to the phone and I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 85 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 28, no, 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 43 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with amendment 42. Cabinet Secretary to move or not move? Moved. Question is that amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call amendment 44 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with amendment 42. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. Uh, I call amendment 45 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with amendment 42. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. Question is that amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division. The members should cast their votes now.
and the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 45 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 49, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 42. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. The, uh, call, I call Amendment uh, 9 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 75. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. And I, as earlier announced, I'm going to call a brief comfort break. Um, yeah, the division bell will ring um, when you are expected to return, but it'll be around 10 minutes or so.